If you've known me for any amount of time, you know that I am passionate for what we would call the gospel of grace versus religion. And for very good reason. I, I lived the first 21 years of my life outside of Jesus Christ. And for much of that time, I had this unquenchable desire to be accepted by God. But I also could not shake the notion that there was something between God and I and I didn't have the ability to fix it. Now, over the years, there were people that came along and they tried to share the, the answer to that dilemma with me. They tried to share the gospel with me. But my problem at that time is that I wanted to be in a relationship with God on my terms, not on his terms. And, and his terms are simple. I'm going to read this to you and we'll look at it a little bit more closely later. But in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we are told that that by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no person should boast. Now, the very first week of this series, we laid down this foundational point right here. Grace is the gift of undeserved kindness. Now, if there's one word that I took exception to at that time in my life before I accepted God's grace, it was the word undeserved. I did not like that word. I didn't like God's terms because I wanted to be able to say that I contributed to the relationship that I was going to have with God. I wanted to be able to say that God is kind to me because I am good. The funny thing was, if you knew anything about me at that time in my life, I did not even pretend to try to be good. There wasn't any real, true, visible goodness in, in my life. And in reality, I knew that, okay? I knew it, and I knew that I was far from good, and it drove the guilt that I was experiencing. Because again, I wanted to be in a relationship with God. Now, religion, on the other hand, religion hates this, this gospel as it is portrayed in the Bible. So when, when religious people, especially what I would call religious leaders, when, when they hear us speak of undeserved kindness granted to us as a gift by the grace of God, it infuriates them. And, and I understand it because that was my problem. I was deeply religious at, at this time in, in my life. And, and I know that some of you might hear that and you might think, well, but wait a minute, you just said that you weren't a very good person. That is 100% correct, but I was still deeply religious. Now, some of you are having a hard time. How can you say that you're religious if you weren't a good person? Now, if you just thought that, I'm, I'm glad that you're here this morning, and, and, and I've got some good news for you, because I think that if you thought that, that reveals entrenched religion in your heart. And if there's one thing we got, want to get rid of in our life, we, we want to get rid of that religion. We want to embrace the gospel. And I don't know why it is that, that we humans want to appease God and earn him on our own terms, earn a relationship with him, you know, through our behavior, through our devotion. It, but it is the natural disp disposition of the fallen human heart. And, and my only guess is that it comes from this deeply entrenched pride within us because, the, you know, any, any, any parent, any grandparent, any aunt or uncle, anyone that's spent any time around children, you, you know, it doesn't take very long before some kids jerking their hand out of your hand and saying, I do it myself. You know, I want to do it myself. I don't need your help. And that's kind of what we do with God. Like, no thanks, God. I'm going to figure this thing out on my own. Now, I want you to hear me, though, on this right here. Salvation by grace through faith alone, it, it is the stumbling block that keeps a great many people from entering into a forever forgiven relationship with God as a forever forgiven follower of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, the apostle, he actually used a very interesting word when he spoke of this gospel that we, that we preach. He originally preached it, but when he spoke of this gospel, he used the word scandalon, all right? The word scandalon is the Greek word from which we derive our word scandal, and it was the scandal of believing. So a salvation that costs us nothing, although it costs God everything, is considered scandalous. It was then, it is today. And even when I was not a believer, when I lived openly in sin, when, uh, when, I, would, when I would hear the gospel, I would think, that is absolutely foolish. 
Because what I'm hearing in my head is you're telling me that you can do anything that you want to do so long as you claim to be a Christian by faith and you still get to go to heaven. And, and for clarity, that is, that is not what the gospel teaches. We're, we're going we're gonna to get around to that here this morning. But that is how our twisted, fallen nature interprets the gospel. And, and so as an unbeliever, it just sounded cheap to me. It sounded scandalous to me. Now, I want you to think about that word cheap, because that word, that word cheap can be a rather insulting word. You know, if you give something to someone and, and, and you hear through the grapevine, they're like, oh, that was cheap. You know, it's, it's insulting to you. Well, I have an uncle who hates that word cheap. And, and if, you, if he hears anybody anywhere say the word cheap, he'll turn around and say, no, it's not cheap. It's inexpensive. Well, let me tell you something. The gospel is neither cheap nor is it inexpensive. We, we've already established in this short series that, that the gospel is extremely costly. The grace of God is costly, far beyond any human's ability to pay. But it was paid for by Jesus Christ in full. So the reality is that the gospel is free to those of us who receive it, but it is costly to the one who gives it. Now, before we explore this further, I want to, I want to talk to you about what has come to be known as the Romans Road. Has anyone here ever, ever heard of the Romans Road? You ever heard the term the Romans Road? The Romans Road is a simple path that you can walk people down to help them understand the basic tenets of the gospel so that they can put their faith in Jesus Christ and get saved. And so we're going to look at that here this morning. Uh, before we do, though, I want to share something with you that the Apostle Paul wrote in the very first chapter of Romans. In verse 16, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And that last little couple phrases there might be a little confusing to you, but God said the gospel should go to the Jews first and then after that to the Gentiles. And that's how the Jewish people looked at the world. It's really easy. There's only two groups of people in the entire world for a Jewish person at that time. There was the Jewish person and everybody else. And regardless of what color you were, what language you spoke, what nation you were from, you were called a Gentile. So Jews and Gentiles. But the point here, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation. Now, adding to that the words that Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I believe verse 1, he said this. He said, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I think it's important to point this out because there are those that are ashamed of the cross. They're, they're ashamed of the gospel. There are a great many churches across the land where the concept of the cross is sort of brushed aside. It is, it is not the central message. If it is, you know, it's almost spoken of as an afterthought. In fact, when I was in my seeking out God phase of my spiritual journey, one of the reasons I had a hard time finding God is because I was going to churches that didn't preach the gospel. I went to a mainline Christian denomination that you would all recognize. I was there for two years whenever we were in port, and I never heard the gospel. The pastor never preached the gospel. He preached all the way around it, but he never preached the gospel. And it reinforced in my mind this idea that I have to behave my way into God's good graces. I have to be good enough to get God. And it, it was a complete catastrophe at that time in my life. So the evangelical church is right in line with the apostle Paul. We don't just mention the cross in passing. We literally park on the cross. It is the central theme. It is the central message, this gospel of grace purchased through the cross. And the reason for that is because we understand the situation that all human beings are in. The church doesn't exist simply to help people live a better life. That's what religion tries to do. We're trying to get people into a proper relationship with God. Let me, let me walk you down this Romans road. First of all, Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned 
and fall short of the glory of God. Okay, we all fall short. Now, I want to dispel this notion. This doesn't mean that we're standing on this ladder and we're, we're, inches, we're inches from getting our fingers and the crevices of, of the edges of heaven, and, and, and all we got to do is, is God just needs to kind of reach down and grab our hand and pull us up. No, we're not, we're not that short. We're, we're as short as the east is from the west. There's an infinity of distance between us and God, and the reason for it is our sin, okay? And we, we've spoken about this already, but the moment that we come into existence when life begins at conception, we are already short of the glory of God. It's not something that happens after we are born. It's something the moment that we have a human soul, which happens at conception. We are, we, our soul is united to, to, to our, what will be our body in our mother's womb, and we are separated from God from that very moment because of the sin that Adam and Eve committed because of Adam's sin. And every single sin that we commit as we become our own cognitive beings is, is only serves to reinforce this gap of separation between us and God. And the reason for that is found in Romans 6.23. It says that the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. Now, the good news is the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We'll come back to that. But a wage is what you earn. When we sin against God, we earn something, all right? And what we earn is death. And, and by the way, we're not just talking about the big sins, because everybody's like, yeah, the big sins, they separate you from God. No, every single sin produces a sentence of death against our eternal soul. And, and that death, first of all, includes physical death. It's why we're all going to die someday. Uh, but even more dire, it is spiritual death. And, and spiritual death is, is separation from God for all eternity. From the moment we are conceived, we are separated from God. So instead of eternal life, our natural existence ever since the fall of Adam and even the garden is, is eternal death. Because that is what life is apart from God. Life apart from God is, is death. Might not seem like it now, but when we enter into eternity, if we are completely separated from God, trust me, it will be the most horrific experience of death that you can ever imagine. However, again, the good news, God offers us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it, it's not something that we earn it's not something that we deserve. That is why he must give it to us as, as a gift, all right? Now, what does the Bible say about when he gave this to us as a gift? Look at Romans 5, 8. It says that God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Not when we got it all together, but while we were still sinners sinners, Christ died for us. This is important to understand. To, to say that God demonstrated or proved, that would work there as well, proved his love towards us while we were still sinners, is the same as saying that God proved his love towards us while we were still eternally dead to him. See, you don't get, you don't get life from the eternally dead. That, that means that there is nothing that any one of us can contribute towards our eternal relationship with God. Only the one who eternally lives can give life to those who are eternally dead. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for us when he hung on the cross, paid our sins in full. And now the only thing that we contribute to our salvation is, is the relinquishing of our sin to Jesus by faith, by acknowledging him to be our Lord and Savior. We are the sinners he is not. He died to save us. He took our sin debt away from us so that he could then gift us eternal life. It really truly is that simple to state and that simple to understand. Now, that leads to a new status. If we have accepted this, and I don't assume that all of you have because I know some of you are coming along in your, your faith journey and you're not exactly here and ready to believe this just yet, 
Uh, but once a person does receive that, or if you have received it, you have a status change. And, and, and we are told in Romans 8, 1, that there is now, now after accepting by faith Jesus Christ, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Before accepting Jesus, we are all in a state of condemnation, all right? That state of eternal death. But afterwards, that condemnation is removed. It exists no longer. Now, this all to me seems straightforward and simple. By accepting and acknowledging these truths, a person finds an eternally forgiven relationship with Jesus Christ and adoption into God's forever forgiven family. But you know what? It still rubs people the wrong way. Because when people hear this, when they hear that this is 100% free to the recipient, they, they get angry. And, and the thought behind this rub perhaps is this. If personal behavior does not play into a person's salvation before God or the maintenance thereof, what is there to stop them from continuing to sin against God? Now, there's a humongous misnomer in that statement. That's what I thought. When, when, when someone told me the gospel, I'm like, oh, you're just saying you can do whatever you want to do, which is not what that person was saying, all right? But when we think that's what they're saying, in our minds, we're still, we're still saying there's little sins and there's big sins. And as long as I just commit the little sins and stay away from the big sins, I'm going to be okay. All right? The reality is you're never going to stop sinning. I'll say this again, I'm sure, before we finish here. You're never going to stop sinning in this lifetime. And, and whether it's bigger sins or little sins, they all carry the same weight with God. All right? So the question you got to ask is, is this a cheap gospel of grace? Well, I submit to you that it's not. It isn't that the gospel is cheap so much as it is that many of the proclaimers of the gospel do not state it in its entirety. Now, there are times when, when I, nowadays when I hear people declare the gospel that I want to rip my, he, my hair out because I feel like they're not telling the, 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 the full truth. I, I keep seeing these commercials on TV, you know, heaven or not, whatever. It's cool. I think it's awesome. But they're not preaching the gospel. Just telling a person to say a prayer is not preaching the gospel. You, you have to preach the gospel. Jesus said that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we need to be a people that declare the full truth. Now, there's some missing concepts oftentimes when people tell the gospel, and they are related to relationship, authority, and kingdom. So let me tell you something. Grace without relationship is a, is a weak gospel. It's watered down. Grace without authority is a weak gospel. It is watered down. And grace without kingdom is a weak gospel. It is watered down. So a full presentation of the gospel includes more than, than mere forgiveness of sins. The, the salvation is not just a get-out-of-hell-free card, you know? And, and, and it's as if people are running around like, well, I can do whatever I want. I got my get-out-of-hell-free card, you know, my little, got my Jesus tattoo, or I got my, got my, my fish on the back of my car, so I, I, I'm good. I can do whatever it is that I want to do, okay? No, forgiveness it's more than forgiveness of, of our sins. It is an, an invitation into a relationship with God who is our authority and who invites us into his, his kingdom, his family, if you will, as his subordinates. Now, the way that I like to say it is, is that when we accept by faith the gospel of grace, we are adopted into God's forever forgiven family as Jesus' forever forgiven followers. Now, I like that word Christ follower over and above the word Christian. Don't mean to be sacrilegious there, but what does it mean to be a Christian anymore? Half this country thinks if you were born in the United States, you're automatically a Christian. You know, as if, you know, a, be, being an American is synonymous with, with you know, uh, citizenship in heaven as well. And so I like the word Christ follower. I like the word Christ follower because it conveys the idea that Jesus is the leader. He is the leader and we are 
the followers. And when we understand the relationship between the Christ follower and God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, then we will understand why it is wrong to say that this presentation of gracious salvation means that we can do whatever it is that we want to do, as if God gives us a license to, to sin and, and just run amok with this, with this life. A proper understanding of the gospel is not going to lead you towards sin. A proper understanding of grace is going to lead us to, to constantly ask that question, are my actions demonstrating a love for God, and are my actions demonstrating a love for the humans that I share this planet with, all right? Now, the reason why we named this series Gritty Grace is, is because the gospel, once received, properly understood, and then put into action in our lives, it instills us with, with true grit, you know, just like the movie. It gives us that true grit. We already said this earlier in the series. It, it, it toughens us, and, and it does so for a good reason, because the moment one becomes a follower of Jesus Christ by faith, God begins doing a transformative work in our lives through the power of his, his, Holy, his Holy Spirit. And according to the Apostle Paul, God is not going to stop doing that. In fact, Paul told the, the Christians at Philippi that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus, the day that Christ returns. So God is going to continue working in your life, whether you want him to or not. You can't stop. You can resist it, but you can't stop it. And what that means is that as you grow in your relationship with God, recognizing his authority while living as a subject of his kingdom, your life is going to increasingly be different as every single day you become a better version of who you were the day before. I want to add to that, not better than others, because we don't want to be, we don't want to walk in that dangerous ground of judgmentalism, comparing ourselves against others, which the Bible says is not wise anyway. But God is going to constantly make you into a better version of yourself until the day of Christ when he's going to make you perfect before him in an, is, in an instant. But in the meantime, while we're waiting, what does it mean when your life starts changing? It means you're going to stand out. When people look at you and say, man, you walk different, you talk different, you use different vernacular, you know, you don't make certain gestures that you used to make. You don't, you don't watch certain things or listen to certain things. And, you know, you, you got a, maybe a kinder disposition. You smile more. You're, you're not angry all the time. But you're, there's going to be something different about you, and people are going to see it. And guess what? Some of them aren't going to like the new you. They're going to they're gonna want the, the, the old you. And so people will begin to have disdain for you. And, and so reason for this, I want to point it out to you, and, and it, it involves the, the solution to, to the problem with the cosmos as well. And we find it in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. Let's, let's go ahead and look at this together. Paul said, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and be brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Now, the creation here equals the cosmos, everything that was created. Now, apart from humans and angels, all right, and just for clarity, humans and angels, you know, humans and angels are two completely distinct beings. I was never an angel. I will never be an angel. An angel will never be a, a human. Just make sure you understand that. Even, even a lot of people in the Christian faith seem, seem confused about that, you know, waiting up in heaven, waiting to get their wings or something like that. All right, makes for good Christmas movies, but it doesn't make for good biblical narrative. All right, but, but apart from humans and angels, the remainder of the cosmos is, is inanimate, okay? It, it, it's, it's unintelligent. And so, it, 
this statement that Paul makes might seem a little confusing, but you need to think of it as a a literary device that he's using to convey a grander idea. What Paul is basically saying is that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, specifically Adam, the entire cosmos, all of the inanimate creation along with the animate creation was was subjected to the bondage of, of decay that is brought on by the curse of sin and death. But a day is coming down the road when, when God is going to completely liberate not only the animate objects, you know, his saved, adopted children who put their, their faith in Christ for gracious salvation, but also he is going to restore the entire cosmos to the freedom and the glory of its original created state before Adam ruined it, okay? Now, this is something that we all have to look forward to, but while we're looking forward to this day, God doesn't want us to live like the devil, okay? He, he wants us to live and comport ourselves as if we were already experiencing the full freedom and glory as the children of God that he has in store for us when he finally removes the full effects of the bondage of decay brought in by the curse of sin and death. So that being said, not a single one of us, though, is going to be perfect in this existence. I want to make sure you understand that. You are going to continue to sin. Some of those sins will be the bigger sins, but there's no sin that you can commit that Jesus Christ has not died for. Now, the good news for us is that God saved us knowing full well that we would not be perfect in, on this side of eternity. And, and our salvation did not have anything to do with the actions that we have done, and the actions that we continue to do will have nothing to do with the maintenance of our gracious salvation before God. We are kept by the power of God exclusively. Now, the grace that we are offered in the gospel, it is permanent and it is free. Look at this one more time. Let's read this one more time in this series. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, not of works, the King James Version says. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. All right? So by grace, through faith, not of works, no reason to boast whatsoever. And again, it doesn't mean that we're going to be living a perfect life in the here, here and now. It means that we are perfectly forgiven while we wait for perfection to come. It doesn't mean that, that we live, we, we're going to be better than other people. It doesn't mean that we're earning a better status with, with Jesus or anything like that. All right, In the gospel, we are all equal before God. The gospel is the great equalizer. And so, bottom line again, a gospel that offers relationship, authority, and kingdom through grace doesn't lead to license, but to a Jesus-honoring life. That's what we want to do. We want to live a Jesus-honoring life. We don't want to be braggadocious. We don't want to walk around pointing fingers at everybody else. We don't want to walk around with a holier-than-thou attitude telling people how good we are in relationship to them. We want to rest in the life that Jesus Christ lived, and in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. He alone paid for our salvation. He alone grants it to us as a gift when we put our faith in him. And, and here's where I'd like to leave this today. If you're here today, maybe one of the tire kickers that we often talk about here, thank you for being here. If this is something that you would like to explore further, if you'd like to sit down with, with myself or another pastor on staff, and, and, and discover what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, I would love to have that conversation with you. In fact, I'm going to be out in the lobby right afterwards, and if, if you'd like to maybe set up a time to meet with me, come talk to me. We'll exchange some information. I'll get back in touch with you, and we can sit down and, and talk about this, because, because I want you to know as soon as possible that when you leave this world, you're going to spend eternity with God in heaven. And I believe the Bible tells us that, that we can know that. And I want to help you find that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one of the people that are here today. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the opportunity to share these precious truths with you. I know that there are people here that know that you exist, and they also know that they are guilty before you. And I would like to see every person 
who struggles with those concerns and fears, I would like to see them find you as their God and Savior to enter into the adopted family of God as, as a forever forgiven follower of Jesus Christ and, and to do so by faith and to relinquish their, their desire to save themselves. I pray that uh, we would all come to that conclusion and I thank you so much for the opportunity again to share these words with everybody here today in Christ's name.